Okay, uh, good morning everyone and I can welcome you to the 20th meeting of 2018 of the Social Security Committee. Can I remind everyone present to turn off mobile phones or other devices uh, to silent mode so that they don't disrupt the, the meeting. Uh, we've got one apology this morning from George Adam, MSP, who can't be with us, uh, unfortunately. Uh, oh, so apo my apologies, I should read my notes more carefully. And Mark Griffin, MSP, who also uh, can't be with us this morning. So a um, couple of apologies there. And we move to agenda item one, which is decision to take items in private. And the committee is asked to agree that item four, consideration of evidence is taken in private. Is the committee agreed to this? Thank you. We move to agenda item two, social security uh, and in work poverty. Agenda item two continues our inquiry into social security and work poverty and is the third evidence session. The focus this week is increased use of food banks. Now I've got a list of witnesses who are very grateful that have came along here this morning, but I think rather than me reading out your names, we should just go round and everyone can see who they are. So I'll start off. Uh, I'm Bob Doris, MSP, and I'm convener of the committee. Uh, Polly McNeil, MSP. I'm the Deputy Convener. Uh, my name's Steve Wright. I work for Edinburgh City Mission. My name is Mandy Nutt. I work for Cast Highland and we facilitate the Food Bank in Tain, which is in Russia. Uh, Jeremy Balfour, MSP for Volovian. Evan Adamson. I work for Instant Neighbour running a food bank in Aberdeen. Sean Robertson, MSP for Dundee City East. I'm Laura Ferguson, the Trust of Trust Operations Manager for Scotland. Alistair Allen, I'm the MSP for Nihalen and Anir, the Western Isles. I'm Mark Franklin, and I'm from the First Base Agency Food Bank in Dumfries. I'm Michelle Ballantyne, and I'm an MSP for the South of Scotland. Joyce Leggett, I'm Chair of Kirkcaldy Food Bank. Alison Johnston, MSP for Lothian. OK, so thank you everyone again for, for coming here this morning. Um, we're, we're keen to have this as, as, as a round table event rather than a formal evidence session where MSP just pitch questions to, to witnesses. So I'll maybe open up with an initial question, uh, not directed at anyone in particular, but just to get a conversation uh, started. So there's been much discussion um, in, in the public about the changing face of food bank usage and our inquiries in relation to, to in work poverty. Uh, and what we're really keen to find out is what witnesses here have experienced maybe over the last a few years in terms of those who are are, are using food, food banks. Has there been a change in that? Have you experienced many people who are in work uh, coming along to use the food banks? And just to start that conversation going, so I wonder someone could then perhaps kick us off in relation to that. I would say the food bank. Joyce Leggett, um, yeah. We have a fairly small number of people in work coming along. It's only about 5% of our total who are admitting to be in work. Uh, but again, in Fife, there's quite a lot of seasonal work uh, in fields and car washes, things like that as well. So I think it's, it could well be quite underreported. But we've had a huge increase in, in the number of referrals, I think, in, in the same as every food bank over the last year in particular, um, and a bigger increase in the number of families who are coming and presenting to the food bank. Uh, previously, there was more single meals, uh, but now I would say we're almost, um, there's still more single meals coming, but families are making up about 46% um, of our total now. Okay, thank you. That's helpful. Other comments in relation to that? an average of 10% of our users are in work or admit to being in work um, and we have a kind of general 10% rise consistently of new users um, but the in work is rising consistently with it as well so um, it seems to be just a consistent 10% for us are, are in work or admit to being in work. Okay, so more more people who are in work using food banks, but not an increasing percentage of the overall. No, it seems to the percentage seems to stay the same, but okay. because we have an increase in usage anyway, then obviously the. Yeah. Okay, that that's helpful. Other comments, Steve Wright. I think the experience of Edinburgh City Mission, we have a network of nine food banks, and this year we will see a fifty percent increase in referrals, based on last year. The year before that, it was a 22% increase, and the year before that, it was a 26% increase. So there's been quite a dramatic increase in the actual number of referrals this year. 
probably about 20% of those have some connection with in-work benefit problem. The fact that in-work benefits have been perhaps frozen or people now still being paid at the basic wage rather than the living wage, um, prices are increasing. And people who are in work, um, salaries have been frozen over the last three years and they've struggled along, but now they've got to the point where they have no resilience and no resources. Uh, and the number of children included in that is really quite frightening as well. So there is an increase. Um, it's not just a spike this year. It's a problem that's been building and now it's reached crisis point, I think. Okay. Thank you. And some of the comments you were making about the reasons that's driving that increase in, in food bank use, we're definitely going to explore that uh, in just a moment, actually. So that is really, really helpful. Uh, but would anyone else like to comment just on the, the whether there's been a a change in demographic, more people in work going to food banks, what the pattern's been, who's maybe not made a contribution yet? Yeah, so from, from a Trust the Trust perspective, like um, we have 53 food banks in Scotland. Last year we've uh, distributed over 170,000 food parcels to people. That was a 17% increase for Scotland, um, whereas the rest of the UK it was only a 13% increase. And some, some of our food banks, for example, are seeing increases of 50%, some 80%, and that's where they are now in a, an area of full um, rollout of universal credit. So that's a massive um, concern to many of our food banks. I think two thirds of our food banks are in areas of full rollout at the moment. One in six households um, that where we've given out food parcels have um, been in work. Um, and that's primarily because of part-time work or insecure work, um, where they can't rely on on their their wage from week to week. Okay. Any other comments before we move forward, Mark, Mark Franklin? Yeah. I, I mean, what I would say to the people we see who are in work, when you when you sort of have a conversation with them, they really should have come about six to eight months earlier. And and that, in that six to eight months, the credit cards have got completely maxed out. Mum and dad can't lend them any more money. And that, I'd say, is almost entirely down to stigma. Um, it gives the impression, I get the impression, there's a big cliff edge we might be getting to where people who are in work, they leave it to the absolute last resort before going to a food bank because there is... I don't know whether that's down to sort of what was quite a conservative, almost like a media campaign against, you know, the shirkers and scrounger story and the, the endless poverty documentaries... But, but you do get the feeling there's a lot of people who are coming to that cliff edge and, and when, when they do come, it could it could take quite a lot of dealing with. Right, thank you. Mandy, do you want to add anything? Yes, yeah, uh, I think we've got a similar story um, in Tame. We're a very small rural area and yet we've now doubled our storage capacity and that is because we've now in a universal credit um, area. So everyone that was vulnerable and on a, um, a benefit is now being rolled onto universal credit. And we've seen this again and again. We mostly work with people similar to uh, Joyce, I think it was said, that most people that we work with are just vulnerable, long-term, unemployed. But part of that is, and when we start to work with people, they are getting into work, and then they go on to, you know, they use the universal credit benefit. And it seems as if it's just part and part of the package of, you're going to, I know that they've now tried to change the waiting time and we are getting some advanced payments but it seems to be that now it's just part and parcel of the fact that you go onto the universal credit you get yourself into work you wait five weeks we get into debt we borrow it off of every single person which is what you you asked when you ring up and get money they say have you asked your friends have you asked your family these people haven't got any more people and, when, and the more people they borrow from the more stress there is, the more they have to pay back when they get this meagre £317, which is all what they get for, you know, for four weeks. So they, they have to borrow that, and it becomes part and parcel of it that you just have to get into the food bank system. And I think we've gone beyond being too embarrassed. We've gone beyond this we too embarrassing to go, when you're desperate and you've got kids waiting for breakfast, you go to the food bank. And that's what we're seeing again and again and again. You know, the system is very hard on people. You are five weeks, you know, you've got people that were never in debt, they were having housing benefit, their rent was, was secure, their home was secure, and suddenly they are five weeks in arrears because they've had to wait five weeks. And not only that, the council writes to you and says, you're five weeks in arrears, where's your money? And when I ring up and say, this person's only in arrears because of universal credit, they say, yeah, yeah, we know why, but we got it's a standard letter, we send it out. More stress. More worry, trying to do work. We start a job. We had one guy, sorry, I just, I'll stop now, but we had one, we passionate, 
One guy who got a job, he, he couldn't afford to wash his uniform. He couldn't afford to put the electric on. He couldn't keep the job. He had to lose the job. It was his first job in seven years. But he couldn't do it because he couldn't pay and he couldn't turn up for work. You know, that, that's the situation. It's dire straits. It's very difficult for people. But can I actually not, not to say that you need to stop talking? Because oh, actually that's, that's the whole point of you being oh, here, is to share these experiences. So thank you very much for, 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 for doing that. Uh, I think Alison Allen wanted to, to take forward the discussion. What was what, uh, Mark Franklin, you were saying there um, about some of the reasons that people don't come forward and some of the, the stigma that still exists. And I think myself and other MSPs, I'm sure, who've um, um, spoken to their local food banks will we'll find that the same messages coming through that some people, perhaps particularly older people, um, feel that stigma. I, I wonder um, if you have a view in that case, you mentioned some of the stigma that people feel, uh, whether you feel that that creates an impetus and a, and a requirement for, for all of us in the public domain to speak about people and benefits in reasonably respectful terms. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. I mean, I, certainly the the whole shirkus scroungers narrative i think has left a lot of damage on people and and, and they're almost made it's it's another form of othering i guess um because you know for them to put off i'll give you an example a, a local um minister who 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 is one of one of our volunteers has been for a year now trying to deliver some food parcels to a couple of families near lockerbie um, and they're in dire straits. You know, everything's gone wrong with the benefits. The, the, the you know various sickness benefits haven't come through. And even though she said, "I will come. I will bring this food in plain bags. No one's going to think anything whatsoever." They still wouldn't take it until she eventually found out. At sort of three o'clock in the morning, they're going down to the local service station and pulling food out the skips, rather than the prospect of the neighbours getting to hear. Uh, and I'm mean, certainly when you know we other meetings I've had with local food banks, there's always a debate about what your criteria are, what kind of means testing are you going to adopt? And and our view is we set a really really low bar. I mean we have food available through 25 collection points across the region, most of them local libraries, and we just say the if someone needs food to the librarian, if they come in and ask for food, give them one of our food parcels because for every one person who might technically get some food which they're not entitled to we reckon must be at least eight or nine who are not coming in because of the that that, that sense of stigma um and and so in our view i think we all food banks should be setting as low a bar as possible it's really hard to walk through the door for an awful lot of people and if the first thing they see is a clipboard and a load of really intrusive questions then then they're not going to come yeah. Sure, just because I said I'll give preference to, to the witness, I'll take you in a little second, but Steve Wright, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I just want to pick up on what Mark said. When we started the project in 2006, it was a referral-only service, and the thinking was that if somebody recognised they got a problem and had sought help with that problem, they'd be open for other kind of help. Four years ago, we reviewed that because we were having people come in who had no connection with support workers or social workers, They'd never been in the system, and therefore we started just taking what we call self-evidence referrals. And the number of that has grown substantially because this, this raft of folk who already find it difficult to ask for help because it's their first time kind of thing, um, we don't want to put barriers in their way. And now we will have people who walk in and we will give them one bag of food, well, a, a blessings bag. But it gives us the opportunity then to find out what their real problems are and on the flip side of that, we've seen a massive increase in um, Scottish Welfare Fund referrals from the local council. Um, my concern with that is there's no, there is no bar. You can just ring up, push a button, a number five option, and you will get a food bank referral. So we on the front end are having to do more and more of the filtering and the investigation um, and that's putting a massive amount of pressure on our resources, both manpower, but food. Last year, we gave away 100 tonnes of food. And this year, we're going to be substantially over that. And we, we're we totally reliant on donations. So there's, there's that side as well. So if we make it, I don't want to say too easy, but we might create a problem in, in our ability. Um, and we may have to close one or two food banks just due to lack of resources. Steve, uh, Joyce Leggett. Um, 
Our food bank, Kokodi Food Bank, has does allow self referrals and always has done. But we are now sitting at over eighty one percent of our referrals are self referrals, and we don't restrict the number of parcels. It's a very free, open uh, access food bank. That said, we you know we know that eighty nine percent of our uh, clients do not abuse the food bank. They'll come between five and ten times maximum. The very small percentage um, who will come more frequently frequently have a complex mental health issues, uh, complex benefit issues, the debt, um, the amount of debt that people are accruing now on universal credit is crippling them. And, you know, from a personal point of view, when I see the mental health of people deteriorating when they're having to come in week after week after week and getting ground down by the system, they think their benefits are being sorted and then they've got this massive clawback in debt that they've accrued, usually to the local council, either to the welfare team, to the advance loans or rent and council tax arrears. Yeah, thank you. A couple more MSPs want to come in, but I'll take Evan Addison first. I, no, I just wanted to sort of address the sort of self-referral thing. We, we're a, an independent food bank and it is totally self-referral that, uh, that we deal with. Um, Interestingly, this past 12 months, I've actually been on universal credit and using food banks. I've literally just started with Instant Neighbour as the community connector. Um, I was fortunate enough that even though I was I was made homeless and I was jobless, I had things I could sell. <laughs> I had belongings, and that's how I managed. I didn't see the problem with universal credit initially. Um, once I'd sold everything that I had, that's when I started noticing issues. Um, as far as referrals for food banks, I had no idea how to do it. I went online um, in Aberdeen. The, when you Google it in Aberdeen, it's the Trussell Trust that comes up. Um, I couldn't get a referral to the Trussell Trust. I didn't know how to use food banks. Um, and this is an issue that I've seen with the universal credit, with the benefit system, is they don't, they don't want to tell you anything. Um, I found out that uh, when I got offered the interview for this job, um, I, I didn't have suitable attire for interviews. I found out I could get a grant for a suit. Um, I started the job at the start of the month, um, sort of about the eighth of the month. So I knew I had three, four weeks where I had to get to work, but didn't have money for bus fares. The job centre, my job coach, arranged for me to get a bus pass. Um, but I was told, don't tell anyone. <laughs> And they don't want this kind of, these, I think what Mandy said about your client mm -hmm. who had to give up his job, yeah. because there, there is finances available for these things, or there's in Aberdeen anyway, uh, through our job centre, but you're told to keep it quiet. Um, but if you don't ask, you don't get, I'm stubborn, I always ask why. Um, I, if I get refused anything, I'll say why, what am I entitled to? But the despondency in a lot of our clients that we deal with means that if they're told no, oh well, stuff it, I'm not going to have anything to do with it now, I don't care. And that's what we're dealing with is despondency. Um, they don't care about coming into the food bank. We have them, we're, we issue parcels every 14 days um, and they queue up on their 14th day to come in. They don't have any, uh, there, there's no sort of embarrassment of that about using it. Um, they just don't want to deal with the benefit system. Most of the MSPs in this room do. We give out referral vouchers for for food banks and just that discussion about referrals or, or directly referring, I can't imagine a situation where my office would ever or I would never not to give give a referral. If someone's in food need, you you, you hand out the chitty and you, you give the referral and off, and off they go. And I've had that discussion with the Trussell Trust as well, who who have said, look, we if there are repeat referrals from individuals, yes, we would like to work with them to see if there's anything else that's underlying we can support them with, but actually, <laughs> don't not give a referral. Give the referral, we need, to, we need to feed people. So I think that's been an interesting conversation about what the point of a referral system is in the first place, because in my experience, I've never known anyone not to give out a, a food bank referral. So if if the gatekeeping is sleight of hand because no one's going to give out, no one's going to uh, not give out a referral, then you could argue, why do we need the, the referral 
process in, in the first place. There could be management issues in relation to that. I appreciate I, I'm sorry, Laura Ferguson. No, carry on, I can... I can no, 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 I, I, I'm I just, breaking my own rule here, I was so just I thinking, stop talking now, Laura. <laughs> I was just thinking that it's, it's a really delicate balance because we want to, whether you have a referral system or not, we want to recognise the invaluable work that food banks do within our communities. There, there's no doubt that food banks save lives, um, that they are there, they provide emotional support, they provide wraparound services to help people in their situation. But food banks, we cannot forever rely on food banks to pick up the pieces of a failed welfare state. We cannot further institutionalise food banks. We have to, they do do an amazing work, but we can't, we just cannot be here forever. Yeah. Um, and I, I, would, I would note, if you're still around, you should look at the next item on our agenda where we'll, we'll be looking at that, that point as well. Matt, I'm going to break one rule twice here because uh, the Deputy Convener has been incredibly patient for the last 20 minutes trying to get in. So I will take you next, Mark. But uh, no, it probably no, Actually, real. it is quite timely that Laura went before me because I think you've hit the nail on the head, which is... So we're beginning to learn the picture of what food banks are doing and the, the added burdens that they're taking on. I would, just listening to this, I'd almost describe it as almost a shadow social security system that we've ended up with. But what you said there is, I suppose, the key question for this committee or the wider work of Parliament, which is how are we going to get out of this where people are now so dependent on food banks and not just food banks, but the expansion of different types of banks. So whether it's, um, you, know, you need a suit for... Uh, an interview for a job, but we can you can you can clearly see how it would be easily expand that further set of. So I, mean, I suppose the big question for me is how are we actually going to um, turn this around. And in answering my question, can I just add a few things I'm interested in? I, I don't know much about who the donors are to food banks. I wasn't aware there was so much self referral, um, and I just wondered. But the, obviously, there's lots of people who do get referrals. Well, what do they do the rest of the time? You just again, you wonder. There's another kind of network of people who just. You, what do they do? You know, in between. Uh, well, those people are. Oh, well, it's a good opportunity, actually, Mr. Franklin. I'll take you in a second. But uh, Mr. Zeria, apologies that um, we had we had to start. I know you were you were delayed getting here, but uh, it's a good opportunity for you to come in at this point. My apologies for being late, but uh, we were held up in traffic. Uh, all I wanted to s sort of add well, two things, really, to sort of support what Evan said before. And uh, uh, with respect to referral, there are people who don't even uh, wish to go that route. And uh, we have, uh, you know, a few examples. Uh, in one case, a policeman, in fact, who had been recently divorced and, you know, who was having to pay for the upkeep of a child and who wasn't really, uh, who had a lot of financial commitments and uh, who didn't know how to even go about referring himself and who ended up coming to us. And we helped him over a period of time to get through. And there was also a situation of um, uh, another divorced uh, man with two children who hadn't eaten for days and had been surviving on water for four days. And uh, he had no gas, electricity, and he received three parcels from us over a period of time, plus some top-ups so he could have utility in his house. And uh, this allowed him to see his children for the first time in, in many weeks. And, and uh, eventually, he, he got through. And, and uh, uh, that would take me to slightly a different uh, um, uh, uh, sort of a, a matter of Fair Food Transformation Fund, which we received. And uh, this is to answer uh, your, your question about what happens uh, if uh, the food parcels are being in, uh, given. Then Fair Food Transformation Fund is helping people to actually uh, have uh, share food, r uh, reduce uh, wastage, and, and uh, uh, have uh, some kind of uh, support for people who want to get through the week but can't, but who are not really in a situation of complete destitution or, or uh, uh, lack of foods. Okay, thank you. Mr Franklin, do you want to come in? Yeah, picking up on, this is something which gets me really frustrated. Often on TV when we hear politicians 
asked about food banks, we often hear that phrase, the disgrace of food banks. Now, I know they mean, don't mean we're disgraceful. It's the whole concept of food banks in the 21st century, blah, 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 is disgraceful. I think it's a ridiculous attitude. I mean, just take ourselves as an example. We hand out between five and six emergency food parcels a year through 25 collection points. We have a staff of two, both who earn 20,000 quid a year. We have 50 volunteers, most of whom providing their own vehicles. I mean, what would that cost if the council tried to do that? And, and one thing we find, I mean, it's often discussed that we're an ageing population. There's an awful lot of retired people with fantastic sort of life experience, abilities. They don't want to just sit there and watch daytime TV every day. They're really keen to volunteer and do something. And the food bank has become this model which has been created over the last 10 years or so, enabling huge numbers of people who are concerned of what they see on the telly. They're concerned that so many people living in poverty. They want to help. A food bank is a vehicle for that. And yet everyone seems to want to close the food banks down and let's get back to the council doing everything. Someone's hard up, then means test them, hand them a tenner. I really don't understand it. Rather than that, I think the, the attitude should be, this is, this is something that's actually working incredibly well, largely volunteer-based, completely rooted in the community, completely local, on an incredibly low cost for what we do. And yet what we've got at the moment is we've got the rest of the welfare state in Britain gets 300 billion quid a year, food banks get nothing and say we must in fact get rid of them all together and somehow reabsorb it. I don't understand the thinking when food banks can tap into so many brilliant volunteers who, who've got loads of talents. I mean the average age of our volunteers would be 65 and they're really pleased to do it. I suppose the question might be, Mr Franklin, that would be that if... Um, the welfare state was to impose further benefit cuts that would drive up further need which would mean food banks would have to yet again expand to pick up that need and I think what our deputy Kivira was, was saying is there's food banks out there and there's been food banks about for a long time but on a much, much slimmer scale about whether food banks should just effectively become part of the welfare state to save government's money or whether or not they should be the exception or the extremity of need rather than just the day-to-day -day provision of meeting need. And I think there's a lot of people out there that would say, actually, the state should step in and should meet those most basic needs. And when that fails, food banks do a wonderful, amazing, volunteer-led job that we all really, really appreciate and welcome. And there's debt, but I appreciate the point that you're making, Mr Franklin, Mr Wright. I agree with what Mark said. I think when we started, we were very much an intervention, a crisis thing. My concern is that we've now got to the point where the state is dependent on food bank provision. And I guess looking around the room, any of us working in food banks, we don't want to create a dependent relationship between the people who use our food banks and ourselves. We want it to be a stepping stone. But there's been a trend over the last few years where the third sector is expected now to pick up the slack and to fill the gap. And the uh, councils, and um, dare I say, parliament absolve responsibility to some degree because we're working in a time when we're all working on limited resources. I'm not going to say we're broke as a nation, but we certainly have less money. And therefore, we have to make some difficult choices. But my concern is, by default, the third sector, which costs very little, I agree with Mark totally, um, our food donations come from different areas. Looking around the room, I guess you get food from different areas, but we're totally dependent on our work in schools, um, some supermarkets, local collections, churches and things like that. We've created a culture, or we are in danger of creating a culture where it was, well, this is what we do now. And my concern is, I, I certainly don't want to see food banks close where there's a need, but we're not we're not doing the education and prevention. We're having to deal with a crisis. And we're so busy dealing with a crisis that we can't address the prevention. Um, my concern, too, is that we've got a fairly open-ended um, referral time. We do it on a case-by-case. -case. But there comes a point when we do finish. And my concern is that folk will just move to the food bank somewhere else. And we get this... It creates more dependency on the merry-go-round of clients using different food banks. Um, and it, it, for me, it's just the point that 
I'd love to be able to put the genie back in the bottle, but for the life of me, I can't see how we're going to do it. And I'm not asking other people to fund what we do, but there needs to be a recognition and some kind of provision. We took a radical step two years ago that every one of our volunteers now goes on assist training, suicide prevention training, because they're dealing with folk day in, day out, who show signs of perhaps harming themselves. <coughs> That's the service that shouldn't be run by volunteers. We've had to start debt management services. Again, the reason that we do volunteer is that since advice do not provide the resource locally, the council don't provide the resource locally, if we, if we don't do it as a third sector, no one will do it. And if we're to address the root cause, if we do that root cause analysis, these are things that we all have to address. And if we don't, food banks will just continue and probably grow and expand. Thank you. Um, Sheila Robinson, you were wanting an earlier on. Do you want to come in now? Uh, yes, um, thanks, convener. I, I guess I wanted to probe a little bit more about the 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 changing nature of, of food bank use. We've just heard s some more of that about the expanding roles. But in terms of the people who you're seeing come through the doors, I think it was... Laura, you mentioned that in the full rollout areas, you're seeing um, more people. It would be interesting to hear a little bit more about whether the profile of those people in the full rollout areas is changing. So initially, I get the feeling there was a lot of younger men who were coming through the door, but that's maybe you're seeing more families, more women. Um, and whether that is a, a, a true observation or, or, or not, um, and secondly, looking ahead to this idea of the over food banks potentially being overwhelmed, we've heard some evidence around the that those who will be coming onto universal credit from working tax credits. So you have a whole group of people there who don't actually see themselves as part of the benefit system at all. They see themselves getting tax assistance through HMRC, who are suddenly going to be coming into this system who um, we are, well, I have particular concerns around the transitional protection arrangements which are being mooted as being um, uh, there to, to maintain incomes unless there's a change of circumstances. And as we can all imagine, some of those family breakdown situations, uh, abusive relationships could be uh, very, very concerning here. So I suppose in short, um, my question is this, in the here and now, are you seeing in the full rollout areas more women and families coming forward? And what are your specific concerns about that further group of people uh, who may come, uh, um, who may require your services and whether you feel that could add to the point uh, you, you're making uh, about, you know, the overwhelming, um, uh, overwhelming food banks and the work that they do? So it's just to get a little bit more detail on that. Yeah, sure. So um, I think the vast majority of our food banks have seen more families um, come through their doors. Then particularly over the summer, there's been a massive increase. Um, and that is just, you know, normal everyday families who are struggling to meet the need over the summer holidays. Um, I think previously we ha we and we still do have a lot of um, single ma males come to food bank primarily because they they were the ones who were making new claims to universal credit. Um, and so we're were affected by universal credit first um, whereas now we are seeing more families be, being affected if you're in an area of full rollout um, and that has put moving from you know feeding primarily single people to feeding families that has put a massive strain um, on our food banks because you're you're feeding you're giving out more food um, some of our food banks are really struggling with the increases in demand um, and it I think we none of us would say you know that you know, food banks are a bad thing and um, they're absolutely a great thing and we all would help our hungry neighbour in any way we can. But I just think the level of need that we're at now is unsustainable. Food banks cannot continue to meet that. Sorry to Laura, but when you say about the school holidays, is there an issue there around families relying maybe on school meals during term time and then you get the, the holiday food poverty issue, which I know some local authorities have been doing a lot of work around? Yeah. 
Um, and I think I think what we have to remember as well that it's not you know some people will term this as holiday hunger. Mm -hmm. This is poverty which happens throughout the mm -hmm. year, and it's very much um, parents who you know get free school meals during term time come to the holiday period, and mm -hmm. it's the summer holidays. They want to do things for their children. They want to be able to take them places, mm -hmm. but the the reality is there's nothing in their cupboards at home. They struggle to put. Um, food on the table and parents mothers in particularly will go without themselves in order to make sure that their children have something over the summer holidays mm -hmm. okay choice like it um, i would absolutely agree with that um we have seen a huge increase in the number of families and about a third of the uh, recipients of kirkcaldy food bank are children um and and that's a, an increasing trend one of the other issues, just to, to recap about the ben, well, the advice to give people, our local citizens' advice has a three-week waiting list to give people an appointment um, due to the demand in their services too. So people are having to come into the food banks. And an even more distressing thing is over the school holidays, the October holidays in particular, we had quite an increase. Um, but it's the number of children that are right in the parcel in the food bank, uh, opening stuff up to see what they could eat on the way home, um, whether it's a packet of biscuits or um, you know anything. If, if we have any bread to give out, it, it's getting eaten before they're, they're going home, which really is, is, quite, is quite shocking to see that level of hunger in children. Any other comments on that, uh, Aziz? To add to what uh, Joyce said, that we had a young child who had been eating uh, uh, tomato sauce at school and uh, then coming to us for food and then us uh, receiving a kind of a note to sort of say thank you for giving my mum food so we could eat some food. So some situations are very, very critical and uh, quite a high percentage of uh, people who access our food banks are people who are on benefits and uh, the issues are complex from debt to housing issues to mental health number of things. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mark Franklin? Yeah, uh, just on, on, you know, we've heard a bit around the table about we're kind of getting towards breaking points on this. Uh, three years ago, I went and spent a week in Athens visiting food banks just to get a feel of, of what, you know, what they were doing. And since the Euro crisis and Greece's problems, the, the voluntary sector over there has been feeding consistently 2.5% of the population. So I did the maths on the area we kind of covered as 100,000 people live there. We're giving out 125 food parcels a week. The Greek equivalent is 2,500 a week. So we, we should be very careful when we say, oh, we're at breaking point. It's, this is as big as it's going to get. We're, we're nothing compared to Greece. Now, we can say, oh, it's not going to happen here. I hope to hell it doesn't. But this is why I welcome coming along today, and that's why I think you know there should be a strong connection between council, government and food banks, because whether anyone likes it or not, we're the place of last resort. If something goes badly wrong, you know, people are going to come to our door, and we don't turn, turn people away. And, and I think sometimes, obviously, the majority of the uplift we've seen over recent months, like everyone has been universal credit, but I think we can get too focused on that i mean one area where first base might be a bit different we don't sort of get all our donated food in and divvy it up and when we've run out there's no more food to give each of our parcels we have a, a set list of ingredients if it's not donated we buy it and and this year on last year i've noticed what last year where we were spending a thousand pound a month buying food it's now two thousand pound a month and when we shop we don't shop at waitrose we go to the value ranges of each of the supermarkets and and try and buy it, obviously, as cheaply as possible. I took a list of 10 of the main items we buy in October 2017, compare them to now. They have gone up 70%. Now, you hear on the telly about food inflation at 3%. That's for your Heinz beans. Check out the value ranges. And, I mean, there's a real big thing that happened this week. Tesco this week do no longer sell value milk. The value long-life milk, it's gone. Last year, that was 49p a litre. As of today, it's 79p. So you imagine the number of families who've been struggling for years, incomings just matching outgoings, that's where they shop. They shop on those aisles. They're not, they're not going to the expensive aisles, and suddenly they're going to be hit by a 20, 30 quid a week increase. So I think it's very, you know, we should never say, oh, this is as bad as it's going to get. 
That's what going to Athens taught me. I mean, how the Greek voluntary sector have done it, I will never know. It's miraculous what they've managed to do. But, you know, this, this could get much, much worse before it gets any better. You mind it out? I was actually going to uh, comment back on what the deputy convener was asking about. You know, what is, is the solution? I think it's all very well saying the third sector are picking up the pieces, and that, that's not right. But it's not just the third sector picking up the pieces, because we are getting donations from people that are paying their taxes, are probably struggling themselves, or whatever wage they are, and those people are donating the food to us. They're not third sector. They're not voluntary people. They didn't volunteer for the food bank. You know, these are people that are going to work and generously giving us food so that we can give it to members of the community that they probably wouldn't even see. So I think it's not just third sector... I think we're actually, you know, if we continue to just use food banks, and we're, we're very similar to, to you guys, we never turn anyone away. We, we, we don't even, we, we ask the criteria so we can give that back to Trust or Trust so they've got the information to come back and tell you guys why or, or why it's not it's working. But, you know, we are using donations from people that are just generously giving those things, and they didn't volunteer for the food bank. You know, so we, we are, it's not just the third sector. I think the other thing that you mentioned there was, you know, how can we put it right? I feel very much it, it, it's about putting support in. It's not just about, you know, paying for the food banks. I think once the government start paying for the food banks, well, we may as well just give up because that will go the same way as everything else has gone. It will get cutbacks and cutbacks, and then we will have to be very hard on people when they come because then we'll be more accountable to the government. So at the moment, we get a lot of grace. We, 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 we supported one man who was sanctioned for five months. He never had anything in his house. He had no food, no way to get any money whatsoever. And that guy was supported, kept alive, and now he's got a job, he's got his life back on track. Um, you know, that was a, a long process. I think the, the, the problem has got worse since Universal Credit. I think the problem is that it, to be on Universal Credit and to live your life, it takes budgeting, which is financial planning, which vulnerable people, long-term unemployed, don't do, and it takes timing. Because they have got, I, I actually rang up Universal Credit to find out, because we don't work with a lot of people that are in work, to find out, take me, it took me 15 minutes, 20 minutes to get through to speak to someone that would tell me how to do it. And it seems you have a window from the 18th to the 17th of each month to report your earnings. Now, you can't report earnings until you've got your earnings. So you're already in debt before you start. You ring up and you say, I earn 300 quid this week. They go, oh, well, we gave you a universal credit payment. So we're going to take that back. And we're now going to take back 63p of the pound of what you've earned. These people are earning £2.96 an hour. To actually come out, most people say they get £317 on their, their um, universal credit. They get maybe £500 of rent, which is um, £817. To actually get out of that trap, you would have to consistently work 26 hours a week at, at a living wage. You know, that's not just random, you know, a, a job at Tesco's where you've got, you know, X amount of hours or zero hours and then maybe this week you can cover so-and-so who's not in because she's on holiday. So, you know, it's a huge thing and it's a huge budgeting thing. We need more support in there that helps people to plan their money. They, they, they don't plan their money. The whole idea of universal credit was to get people into this idea of getting a job and working. When we work, we get our money, we spend it, we spend it on our kids, we take them somewhere, do something. These people can't. They have to say, right, I've earned 300 pounds, so I'm gonna have to realize I'm not gonna get that next, next month on my universal credit. I'm gonna have to pay my rent and do this. It, there's no luxuries, there's no extra. But in particular, you know, people that donate to the food bank did not volunteer for it. It's just we are relying on the generosity of people that are paying their taxes and trying to live their own lives. And that's really how food banks are uh, surviving. Thank you. Laura Ferguson. I think one of the things that um, really frustrates me is that people end up at a food bank but could have received help from elsewhere beforehand. Um, there are resources out there. So... <clears throat> For example, the Scottish Welfare Fund, as um, Steve said earlier, in Edinburgh, you phone up the Scottish Welfare Fund, you press option five for a food bank referral, no questions asked. And that to me is, is a waste of an opportunity and a waste of resource. So why, is, why are people who are saying that they need a food bank referral not going through the application process to receive a crisis grant from the Scottish Welfare Fund to have the cash? Um, and it, 
we had a meeting with um, the Scottish Welfare Fund team in Edinburgh. They, um, we, we said to them, this is not best practice. It doesn't happen in other areas. They were willing to, to remove the option five to make sure that people were actually receiving more support. Then um, a councillor got involved and, and uh, uh, that option's been taken off the table where it, it, option five's there to stay. So it just, <clears throat> it just frustrates me that people who are ending up at a food bank but could actually receive resource from elsewhere. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alison Johnson? Yeah, I suppose um, a constituent's actually written to me about this meeting this morning and, and you've just sort of hit the nail on the head there. This constituent was saying what would be the impact on the Scottish Welfare Fund and other you know, entitlements if food banks didn't exist? Now, I, I, I'm... I understand where Mark Franklin is coming from, but I suppose I've grown up, you know, most of my life, food banks weren't a thing. Now they are very much a thing. They're like, they seem to me to be becoming part and parcel of the welfare state. Mm -hmm. But as Mandy Nutt has just pointed out, they're entirely reliant on people donating their time, you know, donating money, donating food. Um, this is the safety net, this totally voluntary, non-statutory organisation of people who don't want to see, you know, folk in their communities in crisis. It just, you know, frankly, I don't think it, I don't think it's good enough. So I have concerns about that. Um, but we've heard, heard a couple of views. I think um, Mark Franklin said it's really hard to walk through the door. And I've had constituents, um, um, a woman whose disability benefits were changed, who said it was the worst day of her life when she had to take her two children to a food bank. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, Evan Adamson has said that you have people who are quite relaxed about coming. And I have had others who've contacted me to say that if the approach at the job centre was the same as the, the warmth, the empathy and the advice that they're receiving from some people who've obviously developed great expertise in the food bank, you know, that's... I suppose it's, there seems to be some best practice going on there that we might want to, to take into our more statutory services. So, I'm, you know, I'm, I'd just like to understand, there's a feeling for some people that, that some people clearly would rather go to a food bank than, than sort of get into discussions and the whole bureaucracy that's around the DWP. Um, so is there an opportunity for that kind of ethos to feed back? One one thing I was thinking about there was our Glenrothes Food Bank um, had Scottish Welfare Fund's advisors come and sit within our food bank centre. Normally, Scottish Welfare Fund operates as a telephone or online application. Um, Fife Council um, managed to fund advisors to come within the food bank, and food bank referrals dropped by 30%, and that's because people were going through the application process, they were receiving money. And five councils say that they they see that as being such a success because it was face to face contact, and um, people weren't so um, annoyed and frustrated about the system. They felt that somebody was sat in front of them, actually listening to them, um, and doing their best for them. And I think to th just having somebody within that that food bank centre meeting somebody at the point of need and getting them a crisis grant and reducing food bank referrals is something quite special um, that we should be thinking about elsewhere. Sorry, that's really interesting. And obviously, Glenrothes is only 10 miles away from us in Kirkcaldy, and we tried to get somebody from the welfare uh, team to come along, but they couldn't They couldn't accommodate us. They, they couldn't come regularly. They actually came twice. And they had nowhere, because of we, we used various church premises, etc. cetera, um, there was nowhere private for they were, they were to see clients. So clients didn't want to sit in a foyer speaking about such private, um, you know, personal matters. Um, so it's, you know, I think, again, accommodation, uh, facilities, resources uh, are, are you know, influencing what, what we can manage. Our volunteers do a great job like everybody's, we, we, we're actually a 100% voluntary agency in Kirkcaldy, um, and we rely entirely on the generosity of the local community, uh, both financially and in, uh, handing in donations of cash and food. But it, it's, it's not sustainable in that the demand is overwhelming, even our 100 volunteers that we have. Um, when we've got over 200 people a week coming in, and nobody, unfortunately, able to come and give us this frontline advice. 
it, it's just so difficult. Yeah. Steve Wright. Um, we were fortunate enough to work with Sitton's Advice Bureau to have uh, an advisor floating across the network, and that was a funded project for three years. The average savings or the average increase in benefit payments was £175,000 a year. When it came to the end of the funding time, there was no further funding. So what it meant was that people who were coming in who didn't know, like our friend here, didn't know what entitlement he was due under the benefit system, they were then able to access those benefits to the tune of £175,000 per year. We then stopped the funding. I know with the increase in people coming through the door, that figure would be substantially increased. But one, we don't have the expertise of the benefit system, a changing benefit system, to offer that service. And there seems to be no funds f to allow us to provide that. It's about joined up thinking, joined up access, being able to monitor the benefits so you can show that there's a cash benefit, not just to the clients, but to the state. Because this money sits in a fund, I dread to think how much benefit money sits there not claimed, and, but we just do not have the resources to access that. So if we go down the route of we need money to buy food, my argument would be we need some money also to stop that and increase access to, to solve the problem at source rather than ma maintain the problem. Okay, thank you. Um, Alistair Al, you went in a bit earlier. Do you want to come in now? Briefly, it was just a, a noticed uh, convener that it's come up um, in the conversation and also came up in some of the written evidence from Trussell Trust um, about the issue of the five-week wait. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered if, if yourselves or anybody else wanted to say a bit more about what your experience was of that, both in terms of its impact on the people you deal with and what could be done better to avoid the situation. Yeah. Shall, shall I go? <laughs> um, yeah, so the, the five-week wait is, is a massive issue for people who are claiming universal credit. I mean, what, what are you supposed to do? You, you put in your application for universal credit and you have no money for five weeks. I mean, I wouldn't be able to cope with that. And, you know, even if you've got savings, how do you cope for five weeks without any money? And there's the option of the advance payments. But first of all, a lot of people don't know about them. Second of all, if you do know about them and you get one, you're then still paying that back for the next 12 months. So you're still experiencing a drop in income um, over the next 12 months and, and getting into debt. So I don't know, maybe somebody else has um, a specific story from somebody who uses... Well, I was going to say that they, um, they, you do now have the option to, to um, get your universal credit paid two weekly. Uh, which is great, and that is offered. I, just going back, I do, th I do think 17 years ago when I started this work, you would go into a face-to-face -face person in the job centre or wherever, a benefits office, and they would say, this is what's available to you. They knew everything. It does seem like, it, it does seem as if it's a bit of a secret now as to what you're, and I do know there's an, there's, there seems to be a concern about un claimed benefits so I don't know why they're not telling us and we had exactly the same situation as you had we got uh, one guy rang up the job centre and said I've got an interview they said well good good luck with that um, I then rang up a, a, a one that's just Dingwall which is probably just 20 miles away half an hour away and they said yeah there is money available for him to have um, you know an outfit to go there so we was able to do that for him so but going back to what you were saying there um, so it does seem to be individual places are, are, are giving out different information that's what I was trying to say there. Um, going back to that, you can ask for it to be, which everybody seems to go, all the clients that I take to the job centre to speak and to do their application, to go and do the ID check after they've done their application online, which again is another 20 mile away. It's £10 to get there on the bus, so we have to take people. I could run a bus service. I pick people up on the A9 going backwards and forwards to the job centre because they're thumbing it. And they're told to thumb a lift. You know, these are young women. They're told to thumb down to the job centre. So we go to the job centre and they are told that they can get it two weekly, which they love because that's what we're used to. We love money coming in every two weeks. This is why it fails at five weeks because people are used to getting their money regularly. They only have to get by. I know people that get their money on the Tuesday. They're not going to get any more money to the, to the Tuesday week. But when they've spent all their money on the, 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 the Monday, they say, well, I'm getting paid next week. They've still got a week and a half to go. But in their heads, money is coming next week. So that's kind of the, as much as they plan ahead for. 
they can get it two weekly, but they have to do it after the initial five weeks. So they can't straight away get it. They have to do the five weeks, then they wait another two weeks, then they start to get it on a two weekly basis. And of course, that is, it, it feels like a pittance. It's 317 when you get it after four weeks, it's 100 and whatever. Oh, that is half uh, when you get it. And then, again, my mantra, if ever I say, they now that they've now been offered to off till them, they can have a benefit um, advance, which is, OK, um, I was with one boy that had come out of prison, chronic alcoholic, and was just given £500. And I'm, I'm continually saying, you've got to pay it back, you've got to pay it back, you've got to pay it back, and now he's paying it back at... Forty pounds, you know, it's just it's just got nothing to live on because he the, the money the you know the option was given to him. So it has to be done carefully. You know, it is great that it's available, but it has to be done carefully. It just can't be thrown out there because people will take it. People that have no money will take it. But you can get it now two weekly, but you have to wait for the initial five weeks, and your rent is still paid at a different time. So there's money coming out at different times, there's rent being paid at different times, and in, in the mix with that, you then get a job, and you're trying to work out what it is, and it's just a mess. It's just a mess. Financially, it's hard enough for us to work out, let alone someone that isn't used to budgeting and planning. David, David, David Adams, did you want to do yeah, I think that's the big thing. Like I said, I've, I've just started with Instant Neighbour, so I have the joy of my first pay packet and my last universal credit. Um, coming in in the same week uh, next month and yeah it's great but a lot of the guys that I'm working with there is a f there, there's a general feeling of entitlement amongst long-term benefit users I find um, so yes there's there's addictions there's mental health problems but a lot of people are like yeah I want that phone why shouldn't I have that phone so we've got a lot of guys coming in using our our food bank and they've got the top of the range phones or they're wearing designer clothes or their kids are wearing designer clothes, all this kind of stuff. And it's because society today says you want these things and they feel left out by not being able to get it. So they'd rather go and buy these things and use the food banks. That's where they're, rel they're solely reliant on food banks for their food. We've got over 20 food banks in Aberdeen, um, most of which are self-referral. And we've all got a, a 14 day, you can come back in 14 days. but we will tell the clients, yeah, you can go to that one next week. Or, you know, they, they, they basically travel around Aberdeen using all the food banks. Um, but this, the, the fact that the last universal credit payment, and in fact, I think I have two because of when I started working, I will actually get another one, a partial one, next month. Um, if you've been on no money through your universal credit, then you go and get work and you're expected to pay back the debt you've built up through being in universal credit, but all of a sudden you're handed your universal credit on top of your wages, you're going to celebrate getting a job, you're going to go out and blow your money, buy yourself something nice. And that's, you know, I know that I'm going to have to battle with that when these payments come through because I've got debt to pay back. Um, but all of a sudden my bank account is going to have more money in it than it's had for years because of this five-week wait. I don't understand that from when I was looking into it, it's sort of, you know, we'll give you this in arrears so that when you get back to work, you know, there's almost an assumption there's a lie month now with jobs. And there's no, there's very little companies do that anymore, you know, especially in a month. I remember when you, when I was younger and getting paid weekly, there'd often be a lie week, but never a month. So all of a sudden, all this money is being handed into the hands of these people who've been on universal credit. A lot of them have, you know, gone down the route of starting to drink heavily just to try and cope or even got into drugs and they're handed all this money and they're going to end, a lot of them are going to end up unemployed again <laughs> and it's just it's just a nightmare system Thank you. Laura Ferguson yeah I think one of the issues I've seen um, that food banks tell me all the time about the five week period is what people have done to get through that five week period um, before coming to the food bank. So they will have borrowed from here, there and everywhere. They will therefore be starting in a cycle of debt that they're constantly trying to pay back. They will you know, self disconnect from their prepayment meters um, for heating at home. And you self disconnect from that, but and so you're not putting any money in for heating, but you're still charged every, every day for uh, your prepayment meter. And a lot of people, even when you get money and you want to put money on your meter, the debt will be taken off first unless you know to ask for it or unless you have the confidence to ask for the debt to be pushed back. It, it just puts people into a downward spiral um, and a vicious cycle, I think. 
I think it also feeds into the antisocial side of things. This is why people get into prison. They are borrowing from you know everybody. I think there is always a, a you know to a certain degree. I, I agree with you, you and the fact there is always going to be an element of people that abuse the system. Um, universal credit is set up so that people can't abuse it. People that play the system will play any system. They're gonna you know they'll find their way around anything. We are. I'm more concerned today about the people that aren't playing the system and really need um, the genuine help. I do think there is um, uh, um, an expectancy, or I think, I think that it came out when people first applied, when they first piloted the universal credit. The biggest problem we had is that when the question was asked on the application form, do you pay rent, they said no because they don't pay rent, the housing benefit was paying the rent. So we had a huge problem that we had to then go back and get all that rent paid into people's systems because they didn't think it. And I think that is sometimes the issue. People do tend to, a certain amount of people think that universal credit is topping up their life because actually their money isn't very much. What they earn is theirs and maybe universal credit will still pay for the rent. You know, again, it just needs support. We, we do housing support, so we're able to work very closely with people. But, you know, not everyone gets that. And I know that the job centre is very stretched. They're supposed to have work coaches that work with them. But all that is now through the computer. You've got a journal. You speak to someone, eventually they get back to you. It's, you know, it's very difficult. People don't realise that originally that they get a personal element and they get a housing element. And it was great because years ago when you were on the dole that the housing element didn't get paid if you got sanctioned and then you got in problems. So somewhere in the wisdom they decided they would still pay the housing element. So people don't go to their appointments because they've got no money, can't get to them. They don't go and do it. They get sanctioned. They then see this money in their account because they think, well, I didn't get sanctioned. They, somebody gave me a bit of grace and I got away with it. But actually they then pay, they use their rent money because it's not being paid directly to the, the landlord. So, you know, people do play the system, and I do think there's that element of it, but I do still we think we've got those people that are genuinely in need, and they're the ones that we've, we're, we need to fight for, really, here today. Well, thank you. Mark uh, Yeah, just one uh, Probably should flag up, uh, I'm not hearing that much in, in the media about it, a problem with universal credit. We, we were one of the trial areas, I think about three years ago, it was announced that we were going to be a trial area. And at that time, this really quite inexplicable drug war broke out between a gang from Liverpool, a gang from Glasgow. It all got quite bad for a while. And, and none of us, we, we worked with quite a lot of people with, with drug issues, and you couldn't really understand why, because the, the drug use was dropping quite quickly. But we've quite quickly found out, in, in the area of town where it was going on, there's basically a 1,000 people on the methadone programme. And just like the government was running a trial to see how rolling out universal credit would work well the drugs industry decided to do the same because if you've got a thousand people who are going to be given an extra 500 quid a month for the rent all of a sudden there's another 500 grand uh, a month of business to be had which is which is worth anybody going for and what it meant that when the liverpool gang eventually won the drug war they started offering everyone a 600 quid credit line and where they got it wrong, they thought the rollout meant everyone's going to be switched onto universal credit, which, of course, they weren't. It was only new applicants. And, 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 and of course, then you got this horrendous situation. Everyone, of course, was taking the 600 quid credit line, but there was no universal credit to pay the bill, so it was all getting really quite dangerous, people getting legs broken. And in the end, we had to sort of go to the local paper and say, for God's sake, we put on the front page that everyone's not getting switched. You know, so and, and they, they stopped giving the credit lines out. But now it is working. This is how they work. I mean, it's, it's big money. And so they will go and say, you can have your 600 quid's worth of heroin, meet my man, and go to the cash point when your credit payment comes in. Uh, well, if you've got the choice of pay your local housing provider or pay the guy with the baseball bat, it's... But that's we're seeing people getting evicted because of this, because they, you know... There's some people who are pretty good at getting that rent money. That's a very specific story, Mr Franklin, but what, what, what I can say is that I'm aware of it. I, I did a joint advice surgery with Patrick Grady, MP, in my constituency in relation to universal credit and got welfare advisors there and did, did kind of blanket mailings to the area. Will universal credit affect you? Would lots of people turn up who just assumed universal credit were going to affect them, including a lot of very elderly and frail pensioners? who, because of what they've been reading in the newspapers, were terrified that universal credit was going to affect them, but it's not going to affect them. So there's a lack of clarity out there in, in the wider public. They see this car crash of universal credit coming towards them, 
And yes, it's going to hit a lot of people, but there's others who won't be impacted. So that, I think part of what you were saying was a complete lack of understanding and clarity of how Universal Credit's going to impact, and I think that's quite important to, to put on the record. So my apologies, Mr Wright, you wanted in. Um, just to pick up on the comment you said, Mr Confineau, um, there's a lack of clarity about the implementation of Universal Credit across the nation. Yeah. You know, it keeps getting pushed back, and that in itself brings um, uncertainty and insecurity, which will feed on... <coughs> people's mental health. Um, some time ago, um, our MSP here asked about families and, and how the effect of the changes are hitting in-work families. Whenever we discuss food bank issues, we do go to the vast majority of people who use food banks who have addiction issues or alcohol issues or whatever. But if we bring it back to the families, just to put some content into it, I've just done a quick calculation. This year we've seen 130 families, an increase of 130 families who have used our food banks. They are working and they're struggling and understanding universal credit. The more shocking thing is there are 120 children connected to those families who were not being fed because breakfast clubs don't run during the school holidays, um, school meals go, for whatever reason. But that's quite indicative in this nation's capital city that whatever we think, the reality is that these benefits are having an effect on people who work. And we need to address that. Because if we cannot restore some sense of aspiration, some sense of it is worth working if you get out of bed and you do your job and you still struggle and you see people next door who don't work who don't seem to be struggling quite as much why should i bother mm. and it's that insidious eroding of social fabric and aspiration not just within the large housing schemes <coughs> but within the suburbs then we're just building up a potential problem which will explode just come back yeah. on that specifically convenient. And I think that's my specific concern about working tax credits because I think they ha actually have been quite a success, working tax credits, because they've given people that support in work to help make work pay. And I think the fact that it will become part of what is seen as a, a, a bad benefit system with all the publicity that's been around universal credit, my worry is that some people will just say, I'm not even going to go there. Uh, and will you know they just will think it's more hassle than it's worth. Um, is that a concern that you would? It's, share? it's definitely a concern, and I think that another issue is the irony is that as a nation, as a state, we've agreed a certain level of benefit is required for people who work to give a standard of living. Now, whether you agree with that is a different matter, but we've agreed as a nation. But then we freeze in work benefits. So by the very fact of inflation, we are not maintaining that level of provision that we as a nation have identified and want to pay. So by default, people are condemned to poverty. And the poverty will hit children. I'm not sure the figures in Scotland, but within the UK, recently I read a report, four million children live in poverty. And, and that's, that's the thing, I think... With the issues around food bank and emergency food provision, we lose the fact that it's now affecting very different people to when I started nine or ten years ago. That social profile has changed. Trusts are fantastic at providing stats, and I'm sure they'd say the same thing. The profile, look around the table, you probably have experienced the same thing. The profile of our service users, of our guests, as I prefer to call them, is changing, and it's changing quite quickly. And that's my concern. OK, thank you. Mandy Nutt and then Joyce Leverett, uh, Leggett, apologies. I was then just going to add that um, after what Steve said there, that we're, we're seeing that to kind of three or four generations now. So it's not so much that people say, well, I could go to work and I could struggle on, but I'm looking at the family next door and none of them work and all the benefit gets paid and they seem to have the, the phone, whatever. But, you know, we're now seeing that not just one generation, two, three generations, that actually children, you know, dad never worked or nor granddad never worked. So no one, you know, no one's doing that. So we're just 
just seeing it repeating itself over and over again. So it's been around a long time, but we're really seeing the, the fruit of that now. Joyce? Thank you. Uh, another demographic that we're starting to see in Kirkcaldy Food Bank are pensioners. Um, it has been fairly recent. I would say over the last six months, we are seeing more and more people who cannot survive on their basic state pension. And again, to go back to um, Mark Franklin's point, the, the, the cost of food. And the pensioners are a very, very reluctant group to come in. Um, we've just started to gather data on that, so we don't have very good complete data at the moment, but anecdotally there are a lot more people who cannot survive on a basic state pension and the transfer onto the various benefit systems there is really causing quite a lot of pain. Thank you for putting that on the record. I'd give a time check just for the purposes of this meeting and my apologies for having to do that. We've maybe got about 10 minutes left. I'm conscious that... Um, I think a few comments ago it was mentioned that uh, it, might, it might have been Evan that mentioned about uh, options that perhaps uh, work coaches have uh, within job centres to provide support and some of those are being given out freely and professionally and supportively by some not at all by others and maybe another group that would like to give them out but think there might be a culture where it's not really seen as the right thing to do which, which would worry would, would worry me greatly, but the reason for bringing us back to that again is our inquiry is about in work poverty and th that, that group of people that Shona Robinson was talking about that are going to be in the gambit of, of Job Centre Plus and DWP and maybe sanctioned for not increasing their hours or, or their hourly rate. And if there's help and assistance that can be provided at a job centre, but some of them maybe have a culture where they're not being transparent and open about where that sits. I would find that quite worrying. Next week, we've got PCS, uh, who are the union representing job centre staff uh, coming to the committee. And the week after that, we've got senior management from DWP who have to make the system work. Um, so I just put that in your heads because there's maybe certain things that you would quite like us to ask them when they're here, we won't be short of questions to ask them, of course, but there might be questions that you want us to ask them based on your experience, whether it's 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 personal, Evan, and, and you should thank you for sharing some of that, or whether it's from people that you've spoken to across various food bank networks. I'm just wondering if there's anything that anyone would like me to ask them. Evan Adamson. I've got a, a client who's actually also a friend who's self-employed, um, and he works probably three to four months of the year on good wages and the rest of the year he's you're talking a hundred pounds a month um, now he's just gone on to universal credit um, he's been self-employed for about three or four years there seems to be confusion with universal credit about whether the minimum income floor applies to him or what have you um, and his first month he made far more than he was you know so he got a nil award um, but he needed to, he's, he has health issues, uh, he's going through sort of health rehab, so he went to join one of the local gyms, uh, one of the local sports centres, and he needed proof that he was on universal credit. Now, he knows that over the year he will get awards, but every month, if he's made more, if he's got a nil award, the letter actually states you are no longer entitled to universal credit. It doesn't say you are not getting anything this month. <laughs> It just says you are no longer entitled. So it's not just for sort of gym memberships or council-run things, but if anyone needs dental treatment, you know, anything like that, then the letter that they get, and it's, it's taken him two months to get a letter from the local job centre just stating that, yes, he is on a universal credit award, but this is just the way the letters are worded. I think, and I think that's, you know, again, I pushed, I ask, I'm stubborn, and I encouraged him to, but there's a lot of people... They would get that letter and think, hang on, I need to go to the dentist. I can't get my free dental treatment or whatever. You know, a lot of these subsidiary benefits that should you should be entitled to be universal credit. If you're getting a letter saying you're no longer entitled, then what are the agencies taking these letters in? I think that's a very helpful specific point. And we've got a PCS here. Individual employees might think that that's a ridiculous letter to be sent out, but their employees of DWP, they can't comment publicly on that, but their their union representatives, of course, could do. So that's a really 
helpful individual point. Any other points would be gratefully welcome. Mark Franklin? Yeah, I, I think the, the whole sort of design of universal credit and the way the job centres apply it, they grossly underestimate how many people either are illiterate or have fairly chronic learning difficulties or zero computer skills. You know, there's this assumption this is a tiny, tiny fractional minority of maybe 1%. It isn't. And, and of course, if you, if, you, if you haven't got the ability to go onto a computer and do what you're required to do, or you can't read and write at all, or you maybe have a, you know, a, a, a learning age of 11 or 12, you just cannot do it. And, and, and there's this assumption that there's very little help for people like that, that they are very often the ones who just not only are not on any kind of benefit, but can't get on any kind of benefit. And I think that figure, I know someone once um, from the Scottish prison system said to me, in prisons it's about 20% is the illiteracy rate. So it's obviously not 20% in general society, but I think it's higher than the job centre accept it is. And, you know, we've seen guys coming in who may be on a sanction because they've, they've, they've just not been keeping up online. And they'll be in their 50s, left school at 15, often worked country jobs, drive down diking or farming or forestry. They've never had to be able to learn, to never had to read and write. You know, they're good with their hands. And suddenly are presented with, you've got to go on this computer and you've got to do this, this and this. They, they, they just can't. And there's no acceptance that there are people with this problem and therefore the requisite help made available. I think they, they really underestimate how many people are in that boat. We'll be sure to make sure when we have that opportunity we ask about those presenting at job centres with learning disabilities or, or, or poor poor literacy and numeracy and what additional supports are or quite frankly are not there or additional time that work coaches may have or quite simply may not have in, in helping those folks. I think that's a really a really important point, Mandy Nutt. I was just going to say that... Um I think it, I, I think the worrying thing is it did seem for a while that each um, job centre plus was just being run autonomously. That they, you know, with a, one would hand out one thing, one wouldn't. So I would question that there is a kind of a, um, you know, a, a, a blanket rules to cover them all. But I would say is that you know. There, when we first ran out the universal credit, it was very very difficult. It, re it really was a, a little Britain computer says no, you know. There was no way talking to anyone. But our job centre in Invergordon has absolutely changed now. And I couldn't do the work that I do if it wasn't for them. They are very open. They do actually ask people if they've got literacy problems. Do they want to address them? Very often not. But they do ask them. They refer. We've got a very open door, easy ozy type of referral system between the pair of us. And it's great. It works very well. So I would just say that, you know... <laughs> mention that because actually that is working very well whether they are um you know that is standard across the board or whether we've just struck de dead lucky with Invergordon I don't know but it has and they have employed a huge amount of staff to try and cover it I think at the beginning they were running blind they were the p ones put in the front they were handing this out saying this is the new credit deal with it they didn't know how to deal with it and it, it was a it was just a mess it was a car crash but actually now they are getting to grips with it and they're they're very helpful to us so. I think that was uh, Evan Adams's points about the inconsistencies. You get that as patchwork. Now, Aziz, I'm going to take you in, in a second, but time is almost upon us. I'm going to give all our witnesses the opportunity, if you want to make a final statement or a final comment, maybe the conversation's taken a turn that wasn't what you thought you wanted to be here to put on the record, that would become your opportunity to put that on the record at that point. And once we get those final comments, we'll have to close this particular session. Uh, but as you get two bites at the cherry, because you get to comment on this and then we'll get you during that general mop-up. Just very quickly, I think it's a vicious circle. Because literacy or not, uh, people who have difficulty with finance, you know, may not have the money to have internet access, you know. They may not have the equipment. What do they do in those circumstances? You know, what support is uh, available so that they can access the internet, they can access equipment to do it, you know? Where do they go if, if they don't have it? So I think that is something to be really wary about. Thank you. Uh, so time is almost upon us. Um, so, uh, Mr. Wright, we'll start with yourself. Don't feel obliged if you think, oh, no, it's all been said, there's nothing more I want to say. You don't, I suspect that would be the case. Um, but this is your opportunity, anything at all, whether it's just a general comment or a steer for the committee or whatever, this would be your opportunity to do that. Uh, Steve Wright. Thank you, convener. Um, I found today really helpful. I've learned things from different people's experience, but my overall impression is that in a world of diminishing resources, 
in a world where access to services is being eroded, we are working in a situation that has been eroded from all sides, and it's really important that we look to address fundamental issues rather than just the crisis. Thank you. Uh, Mandy, not? Yeah, OK. Um, I was just going to just comment at the end there that, you know, four of the clients that have used our food bank this year have died over the last six months from three drug-related deaths and one suicide. And her, as horrific as this is, I believe this number would be significantly more was it not for the invaluable work of the food bank. It offers practical help in the way of food provision, advice and guidance in a non-judgmental way, but more importantly, it keeps people connected and known to the services, which has proved to help to preserve lives again and again. Whether they're playing the system or not, it keeps them alive if we're putting food in their stomachs. And I just wanted to thank you that you've you know, given us a chance to come here. I can't tell you how many times I've ranted to people that could do nothing about this, about this system. And I'm very, very grateful that you've invited me and everybody else here to really you know, put this point from the, from the sharp end to put this to you. And I really hope that you take it on board and that some changes are made. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Eva Adelson? Yeah, I think for me, the my sort of passion is uh, to get people proactive. I think there's been a lot of... The, the, there's a lot, a lot of the clients I deal with have just gotten used to being in the system. And I my aim is to encourage them to be proactive. Because if I can do it, then the way I look at it is anyone can do it. Everyone can have a little bit of luck. Everyone can have a little bit of good fortune come in their way, but at the end of the day, keeping your mind active is the most important thing uh, for these folk. Um, and I think that my main point, as far as universal credit goes, is that there should be more transparency about what other little grants and things are available, because people don't know about them. And if they're not going to ask, in my experience, these things aren't offered. Um, you have to ask, you have to push, um, and I would I would really appreciate that to be addressed with the system because if these things are available, then you know people can get bus passes to go to job interviews, that kind of stuff, um, that gives people hope, um, and I think that at the end of the day, that's what we need to you know as food banks, that's what we're kind of doing, is trying to instill hope for people, trying to give them something to work towards. Okay, thank you very much, Laura Ferguson. Um, I think for me it's that we cannot forever rely on food banks um, to pick up the pressure um, in, in the third sector and that's been pushed on to us. Um, we have to start addressing the underlying causes of why people need emergency food provision um, and, and looking at where people are best to access that, how that's best delivered, but we cannot forever think that giving out food parcels is okay. Thank you. Mark Franklin. Yeah, I'd say like many of the charities involved in running food banks, we, we're always nearly running on fresh air. You've often got enough funds in the bank to see through a month, two months, three months, which uh, actually when you're feeding a lot of hungry people is an awful lot of pressure because you hate to think what would happen if you don't open the door. Uh, we have for some time had a proposal to uh, the Scottish Government where you could actually do some genuine support of food banks is one just create an, an, a, you know, a register of official food banks in Scotland. Have they got governance? Have they got a stock of food? Check out with local councillors, MSPs, if they're, they're, you know, they're not crooks. They're a genuine, you know, a genuine food bank. And anyone on that list can, at the end of the month, look at how many parcels they've handed out and invoice the Scottish Government £5 each. Now, if everything gets better and unemployment falls through the floor and universal credit's perfect and we as a food bank go from 500 a month to 100 a month, instead of invoicing you guys, we, we, don't, we don't invoice two and a half thousand, we invoice 500 quid. But if we go a few miles down the road towards Greece and we're giving out a thousand a month, then accordingly our invoice goes to 5,000. That's really would be the Scottish government saying to food banks, we've not completely got you back, but we do know you've all got to pay your rent, got to pay your electric bill, got to pay your phone bill, got to pay your volunteer costs. We, we can't do this on nothing. And, and, and that would almost be a deal then where the government say, we'll get the, give you enough to pay those basic overheads and hopefully the community will continue to donate the food and you guys make it happen. And I think it is time really that not just new funding screens, which has got to be for some new creative, happy clappy idea, just some reliable long-term funding to pay for the nuts and bolts of what we do or a contribution towards it. Give us some stability. 
um, you know, rather than just mere kind words, which is all we tend to get at the moment. Thank I, you. I think for transparency purposes, because we're going to look at an item that is connected to some of the things you said, Mr Franklin, and the next item on the agenda, which will be in public session, which may, may not quite strike a chord with everything you've said, part of it, but, but, but not everything. I wouldn't want you to make that comment and then suddenly find out we were saying something in the next agenda item that directly related to what you were saying and we didn't say to you. It'll all become clear if you hang about for the next agenda item, I should point out. I just wanted to draw it to your attention. Um, Aziz area. Well, we are already doing a lot of uh, kind of uh, signage work with the people who are on our food banks. So we work with financial management, jobs, uh, mental health services, training. But I think in some ways I support what the gentleman was saying. We are very volunteer ha heavy and it would be useful for the work we do to get supported as well so we can do it more efficiently. Thank you. And Joyce Leggett? I think really just finally that the inequality gap is widening and poor people are getting poorer, food poverty, every kind of poverty, and that gap just cannot be sustained. It has to be closed um, because people are losing heart and they're stopping trying, they're giving up, and that's a dreadful thing in this country. Okay. I think all that remains for me to say at this point is thank you to all of you for coming along and being so forthright and frank and passionate um, uh, and, and using your direct experience. Uh, I mean, MSPs do have direct experience, but let's be honest, it's not to the extent that all of you have who are, who are doing this consistently every day and every week. So also we should say thank you uh, for what you do. Uh, and despite the fact that we'd love food banks not to exist, please don't go away. Um, please stick at it and we, we appreciate what you do. And uh, stay involved in what is a relatively short inquiry, I have to say, um, and we will keep you updated with our recommendations and how we, how we seek to take some of those recommendations forward. So thank you, everybody, for that. Um, so that ends Agenda Item 2. Uh, and can we just suspend briefly before we move to Agenda Item 3? Thank you, everyone.
I'll come back after everyone, everyone after that a short suspension. Um, we now move to agenda item three, which is consideration of petition PE1571, uh, Food Bank Funding. Uh, so the third item on the agenda is consideration of, of said petition by John Beattie on food bank funding calling for the Scottish Government to provide direct funding to the food bank. Uh, I refer to the note that's been provided by the, the clerk at uh, paper three. Uh, the petitioner has has notified was notified that this petition would be on the agenda today. However, there's been no acknowledgement or response received uh, up to this point, uh, and there's no been no contact from the petitioner since the petition was referred in in twenty sixteen. So it's been about for some time that this petition. Um, I'm going to read out what the recommendations are, which I, I then think, given the session we've just had, I think it would be reasonable to maybe have a, a discussion around that recommendation before we then decide whether to close the petition or, or not. So the committee is invited to close the petition on the basis that, and I, I, I now read one, it agrees that with the Scottish Government that providing direct funding for food banks would effectively bring food banks into the welfare state, something that is not supported, and two, a longer term approach has been taken to tackling food insecurity across a range of policies. In closing the petition, if that's what we decide to do uh, this morning, uh, the committee may nevertheless wish to acknowledge the work of food banks, what they do, and the growing pressures placed upon them. Um, and I think we, that's undeniable, given the agenda item two that we've just what we've just had. Uh, so before I ask the committee whether they're content to close the petition, because uh, I think given agenda item two, we should have a discussion around this. Are there any comments uh, people would like to make, Alistair Allen? I think, Kim, you know, that's a, a sensible approach. I think given what we've heard in committee today, I mean, we've heard a lot about the great work that is, is being done by, by food banks, but also I think a kind of consensus, as you say yourself, that they shouldn't be, and I don't think they would want to see themselves as, as part of the, the welfare state. So I think what you're suggesting there seems a, a sensible way to, I think, bring this this uh, petition to a close. OK, thank you. Any other comments? Michelle Ballantyne? Yeah, I think one of the important things here, and it was mentioned during the debate, is that part of what makes feel people feel able sometimes to go into food banks is that it's not a state provision. Um, in the same way that many support organisations in the third sector, people will come and will talk and will share their problems and get support because they it isn't a state provision. So I, I certainly support the fact that it should stay very much in the voluntary sector um, and should stay free of the bureaucracy of state in the processes in which it delivers. So I support the motion. Thank you, Shula Robinson. Yeah, I was just going to say that I, I think some of the issues that were raised around the table in the last evidence session that perhaps coincide with some of the issues around this petition can probably better be picked up as part of our inquiry and reflections and no doubt the report that will eventually be produced from our inquiry there are some issues that we can pick up within that um, and take them forward in that way I think that would be more appropriate so I agree the petition should be closed. Okay. Are there any other comments in relation to this Alison Johnson? Yeah, I mean, I too am content that the petition should be closed. We've obviously learned a great deal this morning, um, and from ongoing work with Menu for Change, exact, you know, for example, that's a partnership between Child Poverty Action Group, Nourish, Oxfam, and Scotland, and the Poverty Alliance, who are encouraging a shift away from emergency food aid as the solution and towards preventative and rights-based measures, which increase the income of people facing crisis. And we have heard from. Um, several of uh, you know very excellent commentators this morning that when we have people with rights expertise and advice knowledge uh, working with food banks you know that has a really positive impact so I'd like us as a committee to keep an eye on what's going on because clearly food banks are finding themselves in an increasingly difficult position when it comes to supplying people with emergency food aid but I also do think we have to look at the the extent to which food banks are masking a problem. You know, are they a symptom that, are, are they showing that people aren't getting the help they need from other agencies? So I, I'd like us to at least keep a watching brief on this convener. I think that's helpful. Uh, Jeremy Balfour. Um, thank you, convener. I mean, I'm happy also with the recommendations. I mean, I think we should put on record um, what we've heard today, that it's not just the third sector, but it is civic society 
in general, which I think was a very good point made by a couple of individuals, that, yes, it's the third sector that deliver the food banks, but the actual food is coming from the whole of civic society in different ways, and I think that's really important to note. And I think there is an issue that, again, we need to keep an eye on as a committee, again, probably not for noting today, is in regard to third sector funding. I mean, I think I agree we do not want food banks per se to be getting direct money um, for the reasons already outlined, but we do have to make sure that the third sector in Scotland is getting the appropriate uh, financial support, both from Scottish Government and also from local authorities. And I think that is something we need to keep an eye on as a committee over the next number of years. Okay, Deputy Greener, do you want to add? Yes, I agree with what's been said previously and content to close the petition. Um, I have just to address a few points. Um, I think it is a dilemma for any government that sees the proliferation of food banks and other types of banks uh, where you can see that they're struggling for help and the good work that they do. But I think the fundamental principle is if to fund them, we go down the wrong route, which is to acceptance that that's OK, and that that's, 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 that's a general dilemma for any government. I think, however, every time we discuss the issue, I mean, I certainly learn more and more that I didn't know before about the work that's been done, the sort of full range of services, the impact. I do think it's worth considering at a future point whether or not, the whilst I don't support the idea that the government should whole-scale fund them because of what other members have said, I do think there's a need for a a precise, a more precise picture of the provision and what food banks are doing. And I think at some point, I do think there needs to be a full addressing of the question: where would we get, where would we begin to start to turn things around? Now that's a much bigger debate convener. I fully appreciate that. We've all rehearsed the, the arguments in the chamber. I personally think. Um, you know, the start of that process is, a, is the scrapping of the current scheme on universal credit. I realise that debate's for another day, but I certainly think it's worth turning to the question of whether or not we think that the government should perhaps put some resource behind ensuring that they have all the facts and a full picture of um, what food banks are doing out there and the work that they do. Uh, Shoel, did you want to come? Um, I would just make a few comments myself before I ask everyone their, their position. I'm, I'm minded that, 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 that Mandy Rupp also mentioned in the last evidence session that kind of conflation between funding of food banks and the independence of the food bank network as well. And so there's a slight caution, I suppose, in relation to that. I, I think I would also say that supporting food banks and funding from time to time is not ruled out by closing this petition. I think it's the idea of that direct structural relationship between any government, uh, a social security system, and food banks that brings food banks effectively into the welfare state. And I, th I think there's consensus around this table that that's, that's not desirable. That's not to say that we didn't hear in the last evidence session some pretty good ideas for things that we could explore further as a committee that doesn't take this petition to do it, which included that mapping exercise of where food banks are across the country, what support has been provided in the past and may be provided in the future to food banks. And I think I would point out that given a significant amount, if not the vast majority, of referrals to food banks are caused by UK welfare reforms, I don't think I'd be looking at just the Scottish government in terms of who's supporting that sector, but also, quite frankly, the UK government and local authorities and wider and beyond. So I don't think it's as simplistic as, as, as that either. But we should find out what support has been given in the past and what could be provided in the future. And I, I think it's important to put that on the record just now. And also to, to give a pledge that, given the Scottish government has said they're keen to take a longer-term approach to this, that goes beyond just food banks, then our committee's got a responsibility to follow some of that through as well. So I, I think the point, the wider point I'm seeking to make is that it shouldn't take a petition, as well-intentioned as it is, to make sure that core business for this committee, uh, as we look at the Scottish social security system, how it interacts with the UK social security system, the winners and losers within that system, those in absolute need 
in, in, in hardship and how they have become increasingly reliant on, on the third sector and others in society for food need and other needs that we should be doing that as core business of this committee anyway. So I think in recommending that we close this uh, petition isn't a recommendation that we don't follow through in lots of the issues that were raised in the last evidence session and some pretty good suggestions uh, from Mr Fr Mark Franklin in, in the last session about some of the ways we could follow through on that. So um, sorry that that was kind of so long-winded, if you like, but I think it's important that, that, that we, we treat this pretty seriously given that last evidence session. So given all that, uh, is the committee content to close this petition? Okay, thank you. Thank you for your forbearance. We do now move to agenda item four, <laughs> uh, Social Security and Work Poverty, uh, which we previously agreed to take in private. So we do now move into private session. Thank you.